so this section of the book, uh, chapter five and morality and religion, we start to get into normative ethics. So what uh, we were talking about yesterday was um, meta ethics, which was beyond ethics is that's why you have the prefix meta, which means beyond. So meta ethics is is a sort of step back from the whole view of ethics, right? And then what we're doing now with normative ethics, which is the next section, is that we're we're discussing now particular situations and particular rules and ideas about what is right and wrong. So before Meta-ethics was just talking about, well, is there a right or wrong? Is there such a thing as right or wrong? Um, can it really be objective or not? With normative ethics, now we're going to get into a particular role or situation like, well, wait a minute. If there is a such thing as, a mora as morality, if there is such a thing as right or wrong, then how do we decide what is right or wrong? That's what we're moving to with chapter five of the fundamentals of ethics. Does everybody follow along so far? Kind of. I missed the meeting yesterday, so I might need, I sent you an email so that I can go over that with you. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm in the process of uploading that lecture as well. So okay. it will be available on Blackboard. Oh, good. By the time I, I left, uh, like, okay. around 11.30, so I couldn't get back yeah, on. Yeah, no, I apologize about that. No, no, no problem. Yeah, no, no, I apologize about that. There was, there was a whole mess yesterday, but, um, but yeah, I will post that lecture up. Okay. But essentially, meta-ethics is, is about what is, if there's such a thing as morality, can there be an idea of uh, somebody, not not just somebody's opinion, but actually an objective fact that there is something right or there is something wrong in the world. So there's a discussion there within Metaethics that Schaefer Landau, who's the author of the textbook, is going to argue that essentially there is an objective fact about right and wrong. It's not an opinion. It goes way beyond an opinion that we can say as any other fact that such and such is wrong. But not all philosophers agree with that. Some philosophers are going to disagree that there, that you can, that is possible, that that can happen. So there's that debate. Now, if we side with Schaefer Landau, if we go with the idea that, well, there is an objective right or wrong. There is such a thing as that. There can be facts about morality. Then we're going to have to determine, well, how do you decide what's right or wrong? And this is where we're going next with normative ethics. So normative ethics, if you look on the, uh, the table here, right? So the diagram, you s normative ethics can be split into two groups ethics of conduct and ethics of character. So ethics of conduct, the theories underneath that, they're going to talk about what motivates people to do something in regards to morality, what motivates me to do the right thing, what motivates me to not do the wrong thing, and how do I base those actions? How, I, how do I judge those actions, whether it was right or wrong? Ethics of character, on the other hand, which we'll cover towards the end of the, the class, that's primarily about what kind of person are you overall? What are your character traits that you carry? What about your personality makes you a good person or not? So there are two different sort of things. One is ethics of character just focusing on a particular situation or action and saying, well, was that right or wrong? Did you have the right intentions or not? Ethics of character, on the other hand, are like, what are the overall person's uh, general 
status as a moral person. Are they a good person or not? So that, those are two different focus, uh, I guess, areas. And that's why they're split up. So what we're talking about right now with morality and religion, we're just going to look at ethics of conduct. What makes an, a particular action or an intention right or wrong? And this is where I also included the reading, the reading from, from uh, Euthyphro uh, by Plato. That's in the ethical life. That's the other book. And it's really important, and we'll go through it, why it's, it's such an important uh, text. And in part, why it's going to be part of one of your quizzes as well. So if you look at what Schaefer Landau is saying in chapter five, I think I want to clarify because I think some students get uh, confused. When we're talking about chapter five and the relationship between right and wrong and religion, some people think what we're talking about is whether God exists or not. That's not really the topic for this chapter. And it's not really the topic about whether, what's the different types of religion. That's also not really the issue. The issue is B, is morality necessary? Does it require, does morality require religion? Do you need to be religious in order to do the right thing? That's what Chair Philadelphia was looking at in the chapter. Do you have to be religious in order to be a good person or, or do the right thing? So I want to say that the distinction between necessary and sufficient conditions, this is important. A necessary condition is something that you must have. A sufficient condition is all the conditions that you need. So if I say it's necessary and sufficient, then I'm saying you have to have it and that's all you need. So Schaefer Lano is going to, you'll notice in the textbook, he's going to examine theories about morality in that, in that approach. What is it necessary? You have to have it and it's sufficient. Is that all you need to know what to do in order to know what to do in regards to the right or wrong thing? So there's three basic assumptions that Schaefer Landau discusses in regards to why would somebody think that morality depends on religion? You need to be religious in, the, in order to be a good person and do the right thing. The first assumption is that belief Religious belief is needed for moral motivation. To motivate you to do it, you need religion to get you up and to do the right thing. The second is God is the creator of morality. That if morality is objective, and this goes back to the meta ethics discussion about, well, is there such a thing as right or wrong? If there are objective facts about morality, then the assumption is then the only way for it to be objective is that God must have made them. And the third is religious. Uh, religion is an essential source of moral guidance. That the only way I can tell right from wrong really is that I need religion to help me do that. So he's looking at do you have to abide by these assumptions to do the right thing? Do you, is this the relation between religion and morality? So the first assumption. Religious belief is needed for moral motivation. You need to have religion to motivate you to do the right thing. Why would he say that though? Well, what's the assumption? What, what's the idea going on behind that assumption? Why would people think that you need religion to motivate you to do the right thing? Or to avoid doing the wrong thing? Perhaps to avoid a punishment or get a reward? 
Right, like what she talks about. Yeah, exactly. So that's part of it is that the issue here is, and this is maybe the bad part of it, is that somebody might say, yeah, the only reason I'm not going to like steal or kill somebody is that I don't want to go to hell. So like my grandma, for example, would tell me when I was little, right? You know, if I'm <laughs> watching, if I do something bad, like, you know, I might go to hell or whatever. Um, and then I want to do the right thing so I could get into heaven or something like that. The problem with that is that for sure for last now is that, well, what happens if you're an atheist and you just don't believe in God and you don't believe in heaven and hell? Like, what's stopping you? But that doesn't seem like the right motivation that, well, if there's no heaven or hell, well, then I, I don't have to worry about doing the right or wrong thing. That's not really a good approach because you need good reasons to, to determine why you should or should not do something. And this is why I'm using the analogy of parenting, that in parenting, you want your child to do the right thing and you want your child, you know, to avoid doing the wrong thing, but think about their motivation. Worst case scenario is that the child is afraid to do something because you're going to, they're going to get some punishment, right? They're going to get spanked or something. So fear is the motivator there. Fear is the one that's telling them, okay, you know, don't do it because if I see you, you're going to get spanked. The other side is that, well, if you do the right thing, I'll give a reward. I'll buy you a video game if you get all A's. But Jeffrey Lana is going to say, is that really a good motivation for people that the child's only doing it because they're going to get something out of it? They're going to get a reward or they're avoiding punishment, right? It doesn't seem like a very good motivation. And take that to religion and this threat of going to heaven or hell, this is what Schaefer Lano is also pointing out. If the only reason you don't steal from your friend is because you don't want to go to hell, it doesn't make you really a good person. Like That's not the right reason. That's not the right motivation. It's not like a, perhaps a better motivation is that you actually respect your friend or something like that. Not that, well, I might get in trouble or something might happen to me. Or the only reason I donate to charity is because I want to go to heaven. And you see how it's that action is ruined by the wrong motivation. So this is what he's saying. We can find good reasons why he, we should do something for others or why we should not hurt others. And it has nothing to do with religion, right? I can have good reasons why I should respect my friends and it doesn't have to be the threat of going to hell or getting into heaven. So that's what he's pointing out. If your only motivation or that's why you do something is because of this reward or punishment, then it doesn't really work. Quick, I'll give another example is uh, the prison system. This is why I think the prison system is in trouble. Uh, because if the threat of going to prison, this fear, right, that you're supposed to have, if that's what's motivating you, what happens, and I've talked to people who've been in prison, what happens when they are not afraid to go to prison anymore? Like they've been in prison for so long and so many times, it doesn't bother them. Is there anything stopping them anymore? No. No, the fear is God, right? right. So it's the, I, this is the bad approach I think we have with the prison system is exactly that, is that it's fear-based. We're trying to scare people, you know? But that only works if they're scared. <laughs> if they stop being afraid, and especially if they've been going to jail from a very young age, right? Since they get 
they've been getting in trouble since they've been a teenager or something. By the time they're an adult, the fear is gone. Same thing with a child. This is why spanking doesn't work. And I'll tell you why spanking doesn't work. Because at some point, like, the child's just too big to spank, right? They're going to be like 16, like, what are you going to do? Spanking? <laughs> like, if, and also, like, the issue too is, like, then the motivation, right? If the threat is spanking, the motivation is then for the child to avoid that. But children, people forget children are actually pretty smart sometimes. All that teaches them is that not to get caught. Right. Right. So children will wait until like no one's around and then they'll try to do it, right? They're not gonna do it right in front of you. They'll like they'll wait until you're gone. And that's not the right motivation. This is what I was saying with the the parenting. The good parenting is that the good parent would have will try to teach their child why they shouldn't do these things. Why should they should like say, for example, hurt other children at school. And it has nothing to do with getting in trouble or not. It's actually just respecting other, other children, right? Other individuals. Right. And see, so you don't need the fear there to push them. They're actually going to see morally what's right or wrong. And so that's what he's, Shevelano is pointing out with religion. If we just take a punishment and reward system approach to religion, then it's not really a good approach. So that's the problem with relying on that sort of reasoning, that assumption. The second assumption is that God is a creator of morality, that the only way that morality is objective here is that, well, then God must be that person. Why? Because from God is the creator of morality, the first premise says every law requires a lawmaker. So in order to have a law, somebody must have made a law. The moral law requires a lawmaker. Okay. So we're talking about morality, then somebody must have made morality. Humans, well, we can't be that author. We cannot create the moral law. Why? Because we're imperfect. So the only contender who can make an objective morality that's fair would be God. So then the conclusion is then God is the author of the moral law. Which some people have argued throughout history. However, this is a poor argument. This is a very poor argument. Because notice how many conclusions do we have here? This goes back to logic. How many conclusions do you see in this argument? Or this set up. Remember, how do you tell if it's a conclusion or not? Just some key words. Are, Remember the indicator words? There are two conclusions here. Right. Good. How can you tell? The therefore operator in the beginning. Right, the therefore. Remember, that's good, good, good. That's the indicator word that's telling you that that's the conclusion, right? So two says, therefore, the moral law requires a lawmaker. Five says, therefore, God is the author of the moral law. You have two conclusions. The rule is, when we're talking about logic, one argument can only have one conclusion at a time, right? You can have one argument with two different conclusions. So you have right. two arguments here. In mm -hmm. order to make the argument to prove five, they first have to prove two, right? Mm -hmm. This is right. the problem with the argument, is that if they say every law requires a lawmaker, and then their conclusion is that the moral law requires a lawmaker, it's really ambiguous what they mean by law. So do they mean like a legal law? Do they mean a law of nature? It only has one premise there, right? It only has one statement trying to back up that conclusion. So this is why, and it's also uh, committing the fallacy of begging the question, where you're trying to prove something with itself. 
So you're already assuming that it's true. And that's a problem of reasoning where we assume that it's already right before we prove it. So this is why that argument falls apart. And this is where we're gonna to get to the divine command theory. This is the main theory that we're covering today. The divine command theory is this idea that how do I know an action is right or wrong? It's because some divine being, it doesn't have to be God, but whatever divine being, God is only an example. If God says that it's wrong, well, then it's wrong. If God says it's not wrong, then it's then it's okay. So God is deciding what is right or wrong. That's what makes it right or wrong. This is a very contentious theory, and it doesn't really work out in the end as a spoiler. Why? This goes to the story by Plato, uh, Euthyphro. So Plato lived around three to 400 years before Christ. So this is, this story is actually much older than Christianity. So this is why it predates Christianity, but it still applies to any religion. And I think this is why Plato's uh, a very good philosopher. In the story, because you'll notice, and this you'll have to read the story as part of one of your quizzes. In the story, it's a play. Plato writes these dialogues, these plays. And so it's a very unconventional sort of approach to philosophy that we have now. With philosophy we have now, more modern philosophy, we're very straightforward and we'll just, it's very technical. But Plato wrote stories instead, I think in part because stories are easy for people to remember. And, rem and we forget that not everybody could read. We forget that a lot, that literacy is not widespread as it is today. So hearing a story was really effective for people. They would remember. And so in this story, there's two characters, Socrates. Socrates is always the character in Plato's stories. And uh, Euthyphro. So if you look into, this is really relevant now, considering what's going on in the news right now. Plato is charged with the crime and he's, sent to prison and he's going to get executed. And that's what the painting is about there, is that he's going to drink the poison. So the way they executed people back then is that they would give you the poison and you would have to take it, which is actually really interesting, I think, because it's unlike our capital punishment system where we're injecting the person. Here, they're taking the poison themselves which is a, a sort of a mission of guilt, right? If they're taking the poison, they, they're admitting that they're guilty. So he's admitting he's guilty, he takes the poison, but prior to that, he has a court case and he's gonna try to prove that he's innocent. And what's the crime? That he's corrupting the youth. And the reason why he's getting charged for corrupting the youth is he's teaching them philosophy. philosophy has them, his students, those are his students around him, his disciples, they're, they're questioning authority, they're questioning the government, they're questioning what the government is telling them is right or wrong, they're questioning, questioning religion. And the government sees that, the people in power see that as a threat. So they can't just kill him outright. You know, a politician just not gonna go up to Socrates and stab him or something. So, the way they get rid of him is that they come up with charges that they can send him to prison and execute him. And so they charge him with corrupting the youth that now the students are questioning authority. And that's why he's in the court case. But he happens to meet, in the play, he happens to meet uh, Euthyphro. Euthyphro is a friend of his. And Euthyphro is uh, what I would Categor like characterized as a, he's a lawyer, he's prosecuting his father for murder, 
what Socrates is really shocked by. It's like, wait a minute, why would you prosecute your own father for murder? And Euthyphro's response is just that, well, it's the right thing to do because the gods tell me that's what I should do. And then, of course, Socrates being curious and he has his own court case coming up, he's like, well, how do you know what's right or wrong? Like, you talk to the gods. So Euthyphro has a very interesting job. He's a lawyer, but he's also a priest because the law comes from the gods and then he enforces the law as the lawyer. So he has the inside track is what Socrates is thinking. So it's like, okay, you talk to the gods. They tell you what's right or wrong. So explain to me what's the definition of right? What's the definition of wrong? Tell me so I know. And the play goes back and forth, and you'll see in the play, Euthyphro never really answers a question. He keeps writing it, or he gives circular reasoning. He, he says, well, it just is, or that's what they want. And it doesn't really work out. So that'll be part of the quiz. You have to go through the story, and there'll be some questions that you're gonna have to answer for that story questions about that I do so on the on the story on my book mm -hmm. I have the fourth edition mine mm -hmm. starts on page 75 are you wanting us to read a little bit before then and then they started the story Where, in the ethical the life? on the yeah the ethical life the, ethical the fourth life? edition mine the it's chapter six Page 75. Let's see. Yeah, see, the pages might be a little bit different from the editions. Just read the, the Euthyphro uh, story by Plato. All right. Just in, in the table of contents, wherever the, the it starts, just read okay. that story. All right. So, but you're gonna answer some questions regarding the story. That'll be the quiz. It won't be timed, uh, so I'll give you uh, open time to work on the on your answers. Okay. Because they're gonna take a while to think about. So it's not gonna be multiple choice. It's gonna be a, a short answer. Okay. So then. You'll see the dynamics and you'll see what I'm talking about in the story. But essentially the point of the story here is that I, it comes back to divine command theory. Does something being right or wrong depend on what God says, essentially, or the gods or any religion or whatever? And this is what Schaefer Lano is going to do in, in the Fundamentals of Ethics, the textbook. Um, he breaks it down, this story, into a much more formal argument. So before we get into the formal argument, I want to clarify some things. The terms, so people are not confused. Of course, atheism is the belief that God doesn't exist. Agnostics, they're not really sure of God's existence. So some people are agnostic, right? They, they say, well, I don't know if he does or, or he does not. Like, they're just undecided, right? A theist is somebody who does believe in God. They are a believer. And a deist is somebody who does believe in God's existence. They believe God created the universe, but that God plays no part in human affairs. Why would somebody be a deist? There's, there's, there's a number of famous philosophers who are deists that we'll talk about later. But why would somebody believe that God exists, he created the universe, but he's not going to come in and change things? Why would they have that condition there? Think about it for a second. If God can stop things from happening, who's responsible if something happens? Mm 
car. God, right. So even if I shoot somebody and God comes in, in here and changes things all the time, then God's responsible for what happened, right? I'm not responsible for my actions. God is ultimately. I... This is where many famous philosophers who are like, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. How can I go to heaven or hell? But then at the same time, God controls everything. That doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't seem like I deserve right. to go to hell if God has made me do all these things. So this is why some are deists. They're going to say, well, God made everything, but he lets you free. This is why you have free will. He lets you decide what your actions are. So he can't come down and change things because then you would lose responsibility for what you do. So it's the only way free will will work out with the belief with God as well. And then we're taking God is the general definition, omniscient, that he's all knowing, omnipotent, he's all powerful, and that he's really flawless. He doesn't make mistakes. Okay, so this is how the argument goes. This is also the largest argument we've talked about so I'm going to go step by step here. The first premise says God is the name for that being which lacks nothing. So in other words, by definition, if it's God, then it's perfect, right? We're talking about some perfect being. Does everybody follow? Yes. Okay. The second premise says God exists. This is an assumption, and this is really important because in the play, Socrates never denies the God existence. He never questions whether the God exists or not. He just wants to know what they think. So we're going with the assumption that God exists. Now this is where the logic starts to happen. Either God has reasons for his commands, so let's take, for example, the Ten Commandments. So why those ten? Either he has good reasons why he made those ten, or God doesn't have reasons for why he made those ten. And that's just a logical issue, right? It's either you have reasons or you don't. P or not P. We go back to logic, right? So those are our two options. He has reasons or he doesn't have reasons. Now let's play both sides. Let's see what happens if we say, well, let's imagine he doesn't have any reasons for why he made those Ten Commandments. Then God would lack something. What would he lack? He would lack rationality. He wouldn't be rational, right? Because in order to be rational, you need reasons. But we're just imagining that, well, if he doesn't have any reasons for why he made those Ten, well, then he's not really rational. That's one option. The other option is that if he has reasons for why he made those 10, he has really good reasons, he thought this out, he has really good reasons for why he made those 10, then it's the reasons that make those things right or wrong. It's not because he decided them. It's they, the reasons is why you should follow it. But that contradicts the divine command theory because the divine command theory said well he makes up right or wrong here it's saying well no the re there's good reasons why there's something right or wrong so those are our two options he either has he doesn't have reasons but then he's not rational or he has reasons but it's the reasons is why we should follow it not because he said so so we can conclude then that exactly that right those are two options either he lacks something god lacks something or the divine command theory is false from four and five so what option seems the more likely here that god lacks something or that the divine command theory is false
by definition of the first, the divine command theory is false? Right, because we agree that God doesn't lack anything. In order for it to be God, he must be perfect, right? Right, right. So you can't have an irrational God because then he wouldn't be perfect. So then we're assuming, of course, he's rational, he's perfect. But then that leads us to the conclusion then, well, then the divine, can, uh, divine command theory must be false. This is why I think it's an excellent argument. Notice it doesn't deny God's existence. Because God exists, God can be perfect. But that doesn't mean that God decides, God makes right or wrong. There has to be good reasons behind what makes something right or wrong, not just merely based on his authority. Does everybody follow the conclusion? Yes. So what would a theist say? And one of my favorite theists in philosophy is Gottfried Leibniz. He's a German philosopher and he's responsible for calculus. So if you had to say calculus, you know, who to partly blame. But Leibniz is a theist, he's a believer. And he's read his Plato, he knows this story. And so he says, insane therefore, they're not good according to any standard of business, but simply by the will of God, it seems to me that one destroys without realizing all love of God and all his glory. For why praise him for what he has done if he would be equally praiseworthy in doing the contrary? Where would be his justice and his wisdom if he has only a certain despotic power, if arbitrary will takes the place of reasonableness, and in the accord with the definition of tyrants, justice consists in which is pleasing to the most powerful? Long quote, but essentially notice what he's saying. He's a theist, he's a believer, he believes in God, he's very religious, but he doesn't believe in the divine command theory. Because he says, if you think God can make right or wrong any way he wants, without any reason, then what, then what you've turned God into is not something good, it's something that we should celebrate or worship. You've turned him into a tyrant. He's like a dictator. It's just because he has all this power and that's why you should do what he says. And that's where Leibniz is saying, well, then that's not my God. I don't know what kind of God you have, but if you believe that God works that way, that God can make bad things good, then that's not the kind of God I'm talking about. Because that God would lack reason, that God would not be rational. But one would say, could say that God is perfect, right? God would not never do those things. Of course not. So if God's perfect, but you still want to say that he has the power to make right or wrong any way he wants, then God could have made some, let's say, Ten Commandments that said you should rape, steal, and kill people, and you shouldn't do anything that's kind to others because he would make up right or wrong any way he wants. But then if God would do that, then he would not be good, right? He would lack goodness. But we already agreed again with one that God doesn't lack anything, that God's perfect. So again, it shows that the divine command theory is false, that you can have some sort of God who makes whatever they want, right or wrong. There has to be some good reasons behind it. Questions about that? You're welcome to ask questions at any time. That's fine.
I'm just a guide. I'm just helping explain this stuff along the way. So I'm, I want to make sure everybody understands. <laughs> I think it's just so a lot of probably of course be on the final. Mm. Yes, I mean that's the the drawback I think for five weeks summer yeah. courses that it's a lot of information five weeks to cram in such yeah. a short short time. So we'll have to kind of let it sink in after that's we talk to you and then go home and kind of reread it. Right. No, that's fine. Yeah. So, oh, the screen changed. Can you guys still see the PowerPoint? Just want to make sure. No. No. Whether no the PowerPoint is oh, no. Oh. Go back. There we go. Now, this is why philosophers. We always think ahead. We're always anticipating what the other side's going to say to all of our arguments. I do that. I tell my students, I do that all the time when I go to conferences and with other philosophers and I'm presenting research or something that I'm working on. Um, I have to anticipate or think what questions people are going to ask me, right? I just don't want to stand up there and like, oh, I didn't think about that, <laughs> you know? So. Schaefer Landau is doing that in the book. It's like, okay, somebody might think this, but what could you say in response? So somebody might say that, well, of course, but God is all good. God would never do anything bad. He has to be good by definition. So anything he says or does is always automatically good. But then again, there's a problem with that reasoning. Because essentially you're saying that if whatever he does is the same thing as whatever is good, you end up kind of repeating yourself and you go in a circle, which is a fallacy of reasoning that they get the question. Because essentially, if I break it down, it's like saying, you know, x equals x, and if x equals x, then x equals x. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? No. Okay. Uh oh, I think it froze. Hold on a second, let me start it again. As my old professor used to say, very expensive technology that barely works. So it runs, it goes in circles essentially, because if you say mm -hmm. whatever is good is the same thing as whatever God says, then good is God and God is good. But you see how it doesn't really give you an answer. Right. So this is the issue with begging the question, right? If I say, well, he's a liar, how do you know he's a liar? Because he's a liar. Right. You see how that doesn't really answer it? It's just like, I just repeated myself. Right. And this, right. this is what no evidence. James Rachel's. Is. Yeah, there's no evidence. So you just go in, so you're just saying it again. You're just repeating yourself. And right. this is what James Rachel's is saying is nonsense. And if you just, if your answer to these kind of questions is, you know, it just is because it is, then you didn't give me any answer really. Right. Right. And so the point here is that the divine command theory doesn't really give you any answers. It just tells you, well, that's what he said. It just is. And those aren't real answers. Those aren't real reasons. We need real reasons. So that's why in my example uh, on the bottom here, five is a moral reason. Hector says, because murder causes harm and harm is bad. He's giving you reasons why it's bad. 
But if you just say three, because God says so, there's no reason there. Right. I mean, this is essentially the same thing that happens with parents, right? The child says, well, why? And then the parents, well, because I said, but I used to be that kid and I would get pissed because I knew that was bullshit. <laughs> like, I was like, wait, that's not a reason. You just tell me because you said so, but I'm sorry. No. Base it on beliefs and not facts. Or authority. It's actually really another True. fallacy called appeal to authority. You're just saying that because I'm in charge, that's why you should do it. Right. So there's no reason whether it's a good reason or not. You're just saying, well, because I'm in charge. And that's essentially the problem here is that the divine command theory is just relying on authorities. Like, well, God's in charge, so that just makes it so. But there should be good reasons behind it. And there's a lot of good religious philosophers who agree with that. They're saying, you know, we can be religious, we can have God, but there has to be some good reasons behind what we do or not do. We can't just blindly follow. And I think that's maybe the difference between a cult and a religion, right? <laughs> the cult just tells you just to do it, and you're not even thinking anymore. Right. It actually, it actually requires you to think. People forget that, I think, right now, is that to be truly religious, you have to have your own beliefs. You have to come to those beliefs on your own. It's not just simply following what other people told, told you. You have to come to that uh, realization yourself. You have to accept it, right? Right. So that's, I think, the issue that is pointing out. So even God has to have reasons is the lesson here. So with regards to morality, we need good reasons behind what we are saying is right or wrong. And then the third assumption, the last assumption, is that religion is an essential source of moral guidance. That we need religion to help us navigate and figure out what's right or wrong because we can't do it on our own. Now, this is a really contentious re like assumption. There's a number of reasons why. Uh, but I really just want to focus on, I mean, Schaefer Lionel talks about it in a book. There's a number of issues here. I think the real issue that's interesting is three and four. Because you could go through the atheist approach and all that. But really, when people say that, well, how do you know it's wrong? And they say, well, because it's in the Bible. But this is the contentious thing. How do you know or how are you sure that that's what it means? That your interpretation is the correct interpretation? Because what say, well, which Bible? There are many different Bibles. Because if you go back uh, in talking about Judeo-Christian belief, um, what languages were was the Bible written in, or the scriptures? Okay. Does anybody know what the original language? The very first one was in Greek, I believe. Some of them were Greek. So the scriptures are a collection, right, of different uh, text. So that's what the Bible essentially, it's, you know, according to John. So, so there's there's a collection. It's a, you're taking all these different texts and putting it into one book. So not all of them were written in the same language. Some of them were written in ancient Hebrew. Some of them were written in Aramaic. And some of them were written in Greek. The problem with a lot of these ancient languages, though, 
And here's an example I have on the left-hand side in the picture below, in the uh, bottom left-hand corner. That's Greek. That's ancient Greek. Do you see any punctuation? No. Then how do you know when the sentence begins or ends? What do you have to do in order to figure out where the sentences begin or end? You just know how the language, yeah. But then you see, how do you translate a language that have punctuation into a language that have punctuation? You have to decide, right? Right. You have to interpret. There's a level of interpretation. Uh, so this is why uh, I use this example from uh, this book, called Eat Shoots and Leaves. It's not that book. I, I recommend that book. It's about the history of punctuation. It's not about philosophy or religion, really. But it's interesting because uh, in the book, the author, she has an example of why punctuation is kind of important. If you're trying to translate for example, the scriptures from a language that doesn't have punctuation to a language it does, yeah, there's an element of interpretation. So she uses this example. Uh, it's Luke 23, 43. And this is the scene where Jesus is being crucified on the mound. And remember, Jesus is not the only one being crucified that day. And he turns to the, the other two and he says, Verily I say unto thee, Right, so those are the commas are verily, comma, I say unto thee, comma, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. How how would you interpret that? What is he saying there? The I say unto you, this day you shall be with me in paradise right so when are you going to paradise this day today right but notice what happens when you change the commas around verily i seem to be this day thou shall be with me in paradise does that tell you which day you're going No. No. This is important, especially between Catholics and Protestants, because this is the argument in part about uh, purgatory. Whether purgatory in Catholicism is about that, that in-between period where God places judgment on whether you should go to heaven or hell. But Protestants interpret it in a very different way. They're saying, well, wait a minute. Why would God make you wait and then judge you? Doesn't God already know where you're going? If God knows everything? It seems kind of uh -huh. silly to think that an all-knowing God would make you wait. <laughs> like, it's just like, you should already know. And this is why... Protestants and Catholics are going to interpret the same passage, but in two different ways. So this is the issue where Schaeferlein is pointing out. Interpretation comes into play. Like, it's not just obvious what's right or wrong. So when people say, well, the Bible says abortion is wrong or homosexuality is wrong, there's a lot of interpretation going on. And the fourth approach that Cheerful Line now criticizes is that while well, they say, okay, I don't know, I don't know how to speak those 
or read those ancient languages, but I do trust my priest, I do trust my pastor, I trust, you know, their interpretation. But the problem with there comes still back to an issue that you can even find within the same religion, right? Or the same denomination that some priests, some pastors don't agree on the interpretation. They'll interpret it two different ways, the same passage. Uh -huh. so, so who do you rely on if you say, well, I trust them? It's like, well, how do you know who to trust? That's also a big issue for right. Protestants. And part of Protestant Reformation is that we're like, well, wait a minute, we want to translate the Bible in our own language so we can read it for ourselves. Because prior to that, the Catholic Church has uh, conducted all religious ceremonies in Latin, right? And if you go to a Catholic Mass, it's still in Latin, usually. But Protestants were like, well, wait a minute, everybody should be able to read the Bible. But that means we have to translate it to a language that everybody speaks. And this is where, again, you have a variety of different interpretations. That is so, why we have so many uh, religions. Right, in part, so, yeah, there's different denominations, the different sects, right, like because everybody interprets it differently. Right. So then, this is what Chair Ferlano's pointing, coming back to the three assumptions, right? This is where the three assumptions are are not solid assumptions. One, right. you need motivation. We we pointed out that. You don't need to be religious to have to be motivated to do the right thing. That God's creator of morality said, well, God would need reasons. That's the issue with the divine command theory. And the third is what we spoke about right now, that religion is an essential source of moral guidance, saying, well, there's a lot of different interpretations. <laughs> so Shepherd Land, I, I do want to make it there, though, Shivana is not saying that you can't be religious. I think some students misinterpret that. He's not saying you can't be religious, but saying it's not clear and straightforward that religion is going to tell you what's right or wrong. And that if it really relies on reasons, you don't need to be religious to have good reasons why you should or should not do something. So this is why I said there is no necessary. In the back, there's no necessary condition that says you need to be religious in order to to know morality. That's essentially what he's trying to point out. Questions. 